As he was walking along the shore, he, he looked down the beach and he saw this human figure seemed to be dancing along. And as he walked a little closer, the thought of somebody dancing to start this, his day was quite a wonderful thought. And so he, he hurries up and gets a little closer and he knows it's, it's not anyone dancing at all, it's a little boy. And this little boy is bending down and he's throwing objects into the ocean. And so he hurries along and his curiosity gets him and he, he asks, Good morning. What are you doing? I'm throwing starfish into the ocean. And as it does, it gets the best of you, doesn't it? Why are you doing that? The sun's going, coming up. The tide's going out. And if I don't throw these starfish back in the ocean, they're going to die. And he cynically sort of chuckles and says, young man, don't you know there are miles and miles and miles of seashore. You are never going to be make, able to make a difference. And with that, the little boy reaches down and grabs that starfish and chunks it in the water. He looks back and says, made a difference for that one. What difference will we make? And for the topic that we have this morning, as we think about the topic and what's going on, there is a, a sense in which we begin to, to look at it and, and all the details and everything that sort of surrounds it and the things we want to pop up and attendance and all the, the, the things maybe that come to your mind when you think about faithfulness, it, it sort of gets in the way of what God's calling us to do and what God is calling to be. God's demanding, like he always is, I suppose, for us to be like Matthew 18 and verse 3, like the little boy, that I can, I can make a difference. I can do it. May we respond like him. You know, Matthew 25 and verse 23, when Jesus said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You remember what was so good and well done? You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you Lord of many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And by implication, and I hope you'll pay attention this morning as we think about what happens when we're not faithful. You'll never hear those words. And the people you should be loving may not either. And so I humbly have been praying about it and thinking about it. I hope you'll join me this morning as we study faithfulness. As we look at what it is this morning, it's a difference-making study. And as we begin to look at it, it seems kind of simple, but we, we need to sort of define it. What is faithfulness? The American Standard Version, it begins to look at all these scriptures. This word faithfulness appears 51 times. And in each one, it begins to talk about the idea of being loyal, being dependable. Somebody, someone can count on. Jesus spoke and he challenged the church in Smyrna. You remember Revelation 2 and verse, be faithful unto death and then I will give you the crown of life. We could read it as it says. Faithfulness tied to our eternity and thinking about being dependable, how we're going to overcome, one we can count on. And you look and you think about what it means to be faithful. Matthew 25 and verse 23 that we just read it a moment ago. We looked at that he was faithful in a few things. It was the talents, the parable of the talents. And he gave one five and one two and one, just one, and he didn't do anything with it, did it? But, but the one with two, you've been faithful just in those two, and you think about, hey, I could count on you. When Jesus came home to do the reckoning, I could count on you. You did it. You're dependable. You're loyal. You're somebody I can count. That's this idea of faithfulness. But I think the question begins to come, and it, it looks in our minds, and we, we think about this next idea. In faithfulness, when we begin to see it, but what is it that we're supposed to be doing? Faithfulness that I'm loyal, I'm dependable, people can count on me. God, you can count on me to do what I'm supposed to be doing, but what are we supposed to be doing? What do I have to do? It was a question that was asked. Do you remember in Luke 10? Luke 10, verse 20. What do I have to do? Do you want to know what we have to do? We want like a list of things that says, hey, if you check it off X, Y, Z, right? One, two, three. Then that's faithfulness, that's heaven, and we can just 
hold on to it. And Jesus sort of gave an answer, and I, I want us to be thinking about that. What was his answer? Look at it in just a moment. You begin to think about faithfulness and what it means and how we can lay hold of it. And it, it's not always that simple. I read the Sermon on the Mount. Sam, fin- I got to finish that study with you all, and you think about the challenge that's there. Have you ever done this? You, you read about what it means to be a part of that heavenly kingdom, what it means to be a part of a Christian. This is what a Christian looks like, and I begin to, to check them off. I must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. That seems like a tall task. It seems kind of difficult. You know, they said don't murder, but I, I can't even be angry with my brother. Christians doing what they're supposed to be, I can't even be angry with my brother. Actually, it goes a step further, doesn't it? And he begins to talk to me and tell me, and Jesus says, no, actually, if, if you're coming to worship, you have something against your brother. You leave immediately. Your worship's interfering. You must seek reconciliation and forgiveness. And that sermon, he puts the burden, Matthew 18, on the, not the person who did the wrong, the person who's been wronged. What's it take to be faithful? And I read it in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. This deep, tall task I read in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24 and 25. Faithfulness means Christians, they, they show up. They assemble. with. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some. We, we've got to be there. We've got to show up. And the list goes on. And I, I think about, I've got to pray right, Matthew 6, 5 through 13. I've got to give right, Matthew 6 and verse 1. I've got to do all these things. And you, you consider for just a moment, though, you, you realize the parable of the talents? What, what was it that was happening in the parable of the talents? One got five, and the other got two. And at the end of it all, he comes out and he says, well done. You've been faithful. I don't know if it's starting to sink in yet. or The the point I'm trying to make and the point the parable makes, though, is what it means for you to be faithful is different than what it means for you to be faithful. It begins to muddy the waters, and I I begin to see I just can't make a list, and yet it's tied to my eternity. Heaven's hanging with how I answer what it means to be faithful, to be loyal and dependable, and you mean, you can't just tell me what I need to go do and go be. I'm not as nice as Sam is. Uh, that some of these are listed up here and we're thinking about well, what do I have to do? How are we going to be? I hope you'll be turning in your Bible and at least thinking about these moments in Scripture and you, you look through and I think there's three that sort of jump out to me. How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. The words of Christ, those are the ones we're going to be judged by and we think about these words and what they are and what they mean and and how we know what we're supposed to be doing and we're tied to them and there's three places in particular. You begin to look in scripture when he, he calls them out. He calls out his apostles. He calls out Peter. He calls out again the apostles together. Matthew 8. Matthew 8, maybe you remember. In Matthew 8, there's a a situation in which they they get in a boat and they push away from the shore. What do I have to do? We're answering, remember. What do I have to do to be faithful? And they push away from the shore and and they get real scared and nervous and don't you care about we're going to die? What does Jesus say? Oh, ye of little faith, don't you know you're with Jesus? That's not the only occasion when little faith comes into mind. And, and you move ahead to Matthew chapter 14, and you see the incident where Peter's there. P- Peter's there in Matthew 14, and he steps out of the boat again. And it, what a awe-inspiring scene to think of. Peter walks on water. We talked about that Wednesday. He's walking on water, and it, he's full of faith. And then at some point, he begins to doubt, and he begins to sink and no more faith. Peter, in all the long years, Jesus trying to build up the apostles, build up Peter. I need to depend on you. Three years I'm going to spend my life with you and, because I need you to carry on a message. I need you to do your job. I need you to be faithful, ye of little faith. But there was one more incident. 
It, he just happens uh, when you're looking through uh, Matthew 16 and verse 8. They fed, uh, Jesus has just done the miracle of feeding uh, the 5,000 and, and the, these individuals, uh, the disciples, they're walking and they're talking about and Jesus says, be, be careful of the leaven of the Pharisees. And then he be, they have this discussion. Leaven comes to mind and they begin to think about bread and they, is it because we forgot the bread? And Jesus rebukes them right there. Oh, you have little faith, don't you? I don't need you to have bread. And they completely miss the topic and the point in the next couple of verses say, oh, then they realized he wasn't talking about bread at all. He was talking about the leaven of the Pharisees and the scribes and their teachings. We miss the whole point when we forget something. We forget we're in the presence of a great God and the presence of Christ. Would you turn to Matthew 25? Matthew 25 is, is really all about faithfulness and as he's ending it and he's connecting this idea of faithfulness and he's connecting the idea of heaven together that they, they must go hand in hand together, there's something that's said that I think sheds light on, hey, what do I have to do? What do I have to be? What does it mean to be faithful? And I asked the question, I, I want to know, I want to go to heaven. Verse 34 says, Matthew 25, the king will say to those on his right hand, come you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I, I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and, and you came to me. And the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When do we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when do we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer, Jesus will answer. Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. I wonder if we forget and we compartmentalize so much our lives and uh, my responsibilities as a mom and my responsibilities as a dad and my responsibilities as grandparents and the responsibilities I have at my job and the responsibility, oh, I've got to do that church work. I've got to be a Christian. I've got to be faithful to my God and we forget that this faithfulness permeates everything about who we are. Well, what do we have to do? I don't know if you saw it. What was Jesus trying to, to get across? What was he trying to do to prepare them to be able to, to be faithful, to win souls, to carry the banner of Christianity, to make sure it didn't die out? Everything you do <laughs> and everything you are, I, I'm acting in the presence of Christ. The one who can calm storms, right? The one who could feed the 5,000. The one who can walk on water. He's there. In that study we're doing in Revelation, it's so powerful thought, but we see Jesus as this Jesus who's holding, or he's in the midst of these lampstands. Revelation chapter 1 says, and 2 says that these lampstands are the churches. Here's Jesus, King Jesus, in the midst of the churches. I'm right there in your presence. I'm right there with you. And it's going to maybe seem sort of like a cup preacher. You didn't really, hey, tell me, what does it mean to be faithful? You're, you know, Corey can't answer. And that's sort of the beauty about that. I can't really answer that for you. can't walk with you, but somebody does. Jesus comes along and he says, oh, faithfulness, it's, it's a result of somebody who's full of faith that knows I'm walking hand in hand, if we could say it that way, with Christ. He's there, I'm there with him, I'm in his presence. What does it mean to be faithful? Galatians 2 and verse 20, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. I think about what do we do? What's the, the, 
the, the benchmark for faithfulness. What do we do? And I'm not always a numbers guy, but numbers sort of tell a lot, don't they? There's a lot of things that are sort of run together and we could, we could say we, we've got to do it. You remember what it said in Hebrews 10, 25? Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. But when I live my life in the presence of Christ, that I'm not just serving you and you, I, I, I'm actually, when I take his hand and I go with him and we go knock doors or, uh, you know, a cup of cold water, I'm not just serving him, I'm serving Christ. And so it's not about pew sitting, Hebrews 10, 25, but look at 24. It's for the, the stirring up of souls, right? It's instigating people to love God more, to see him more. It's not about the list or an attendance. It's not about any of those things. And I, I struggled with something, I, how to communicate to you all what, what God says about faithfulness prayed about it and thought about it and when I look at it it's somebody who lives their life full of faith it's connected to eternity and it and it's so much better than what the world's offering I I read something not long ago we got actually a, a letter in the mail whenever I was in Caddo and uh, it was inviting folks to, in September to National Back to Church Sunday National Back to Church Sunday, and I think it's a great idea, a wonderful idea, except for maybe the attitude and the spirit of it. Notice what some things are saying, and I took this from their website. Ms. Bethany says, National Back to Church Sunday, it's a, it's a great time to start looking for a church that suits you. I don't think there be, could be a clear definition or illustration of Proverbs 14 and verse 12. There's a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is the way of death. I don't want a church that suits me because I don't find that in Scripture because when I read through there and I, I see the way it's calling me to love my wife, <laughs> it, it's sort of difficult. When I read through Scripture and I see the way it's calling me to reach out to other people, it's, it's really challenging. It's not what I would choose if I was going to build a church. God's all along prodding us and motivating us and poking us to greater service in his kingdom, to be faithful, to do your job. I don't want a suit, church that suits me. I want one that search, suits Jesus. <laughs> I want one that's all about Jesus and we think about I'm in his presence and we think about this call to faithfulness, how it's connected to our eternity. And I think there's one more thing and maybe this will sort of bring it full circle and the preacher won't be talking in circles. <laughs> what does it mean to be faithful? And I hope you'll think for a minute about what it means to be faithful. God, help my faithfulness. God, help my faithfulness. Matthew 7 and verses 13 and 14 say something re really sort of powerful and sometimes confusing. He says this straight way. Sometimes we read that uh, like saying, you know, straight, you know, this line with no curves from point A to point B, and that's not at all the word that's there. It's this narrow, difficult passageway. There's a wide way, and it doesn't take, it's the easy way. He's calling us, and this is why faithfulness is so important to this difficult path this hard path. God, help my faithfulness. Help me to walk through this line. And, and this is where it sort of comes to you. And here's a verse that I think hopefully will, will help your faithfulness, two of them. First one, 1 Corinthians 12. When you look at 1 Corinthians 12 and you think about what's this call to faithfulness? What, what does it mean to be faithful? I hope you also remember. But now God, he set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleases. I looked at that passage ever since the marriage retreat in a really new way, in a powerful way, and you think about, hey, he didn't mess up putting you where you are. There's no dead weight in God's family. And he's expecting you to do something, to be dependable, that he can count on you. 
and in his great infinite wisdom, when he responded to his call to follow that difficult path, he knows what he's doing, and he puts you where you are. There's another passage that sort of piggybacks on that idea in Ephesians chapter 4. We'll look at that and make some final application. And we're talking about elders. We're talking about the church organization. We're talking about how things are, are put together so that we'll no longer be children tossed to and fro, but really that we'll be faithful, that we'll be wholly committed to Jesus. And he says in verse 16, from whom the whole body, that's Christ, joined and knit together by which every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Sam asked a really powerful question a few weeks before we got here to you all on an invitation, talking about the great body of Christ and uh, how we're this spiritual house being built up. And he said something actually that motivated me to, to pack a few more boxes. <laughs> uh, I sent him that message, right? Hey, the whole, we're so blessed here to have Sam to feed us each and every week. And what he said was, the whole that's missing, you know, that, that block and being built up in this spiritual house that's missing, it, it's you. Oh, won't you respond and see that God wants to make you a part of that house? But I would just like you to think for just a moment, is that true? If we take your block out, is anybody really going to care? Is the church going to be any different? Our souls going to be reached? Is anybody going to know? Are, are your kids going to miss anything that's going to get them closer to heaven? Is the body of Christ being edified? Yeah, yeah hands are important. <laughs> Wonderful feet. You're not going to get anywhere without them, my head, but joints? Are you sure, God, you know what you're talking about? God knew what he was doing when he placed you in the body. And he says, I expect you to do, you're talented. You say, yeah, but I, I'm getting older and I can't do the things that I used to, to do. Amen, God would say. I don't want you to do those things anymore. <laughs> My plan is foolproof. You need to serve somewhere else. I'm too young. I can't, I can't do, there's no JV we talked about this morning. God saves them and he puts you in the body. Faith, can we depend upon you, God says. I want you to do your part, this faithfulness. What do I do? It's connected to eternity and I hope this story motivates you like it did me. I, I know it's not a real good picture, but that's Esmond Green. This story gives me chills when we think about Esmond Green and she's lying there. And here's what the video says as it showed the still shots of the surveillance video. A sad death in New York City. Surveillance cameras in a city-run psychiatric hospital emergency room in Brooklyn capture a woman falling from a chair, writhing on the floor and dying. Hospital staff and other patients watch and do nothing for over an hour. One guard doesn't even leave his chair, rolling it around the corner to stare at the body. The NYCLU sued the facility Kings County Hospital Center last year over the way it treats its psychiatric patients. The city's medical examiner has yet to determine why the woman, 49-year-old Esmond Green, died on June 20th. She had been waiting in the emergency room 24 hours. Rob Cohen, the attorney, stated, the reason this woman died the way she did is because there's a culture of indifference to patients that permeates every aspect of this hospital's psychiatric care. Surveillance shows a member of the medical staff attending the green, but it was too late. She was already dead. I read this story from Philip Jenkins, and he said it gave him chills, and it gave me chills for the same reason. Because our homes are full of Esmond Greens. Uh, Esmond Green, a woman who came to the right place where she was supposed to come to get the, the care that she needed. And there was nobody doing their job to help her. Our church buildings are full of Esmond Greens. Who's the Esmond Green in your life? 
you are joined. God's placed you there to do a job, to connect souls, to change somebody's eternity. Why aren't you doing it? There's Esmond Greens and there's individuals longing for somebody to respond. And the discourse I had with the individual who wrote that book, he said something profound. I just love this guy more and more, Philip Jenkins. But in our correspondence, as he wrote back, he said this, to God be the story. <laughs> Wait a minute. Did you mean to say, to God be the glory? Right? You meant to say, to God be the glory. No, to God be the story. And I wonder this morning, and I know we didn't get to get in depth, what am I supposed to do and who am I supposed to be? And the, the thing is, when I read the word and it convicts me, I'm not a mom, I'm not a grandmother, I'm not in the, the roles and the situation. I don't have the influence that, that you have in the different areas that you have, and I don't have the talents that you have to be able to do the things that you do, but I hope we'll all remember Esmond Green. And they're sitting in the pews next to us, and they're, at our jobs, and they're the children at our homes, writhing in pain, striving for somebody to connect them to the blood of Christ and who he is and what he can offer. There's no dead weight on God's team. He's demanding for all of us to be faithful, to do our job. Can God depend upon you to do it? To God be the story. And I don't know if you're convicted in any way. If God has said something to you, I would like to be a teacher. You know what? I have this talent, and I can really work with children. You know what? I'm really good at encouraging people, and I just haven't been encouraging people enough. Or maybe it's in other areas. I'm holding this grudge. I, there's this grudge that's eating at me, and I haven't taken care of it. My spouse has been neglected. God's put this weight upon my shoulders and I read through Scripture and I realize my responsibilities as a Christian spouse, I haven't been living up to them. <laughs> There's an individual that I've seen every single day of my life and I've never told them about the love of Christ and what he could do. You know, all those things describe an unfaithful person. <laughs> an unfaithful person not doing the job that God expects them to do. Listen, this isn't a, a beat you up sermon. To me, this is an encouraging sermon. I, I want to know that when I, I meet Jesus and I sit there in his presence that I took advantage of the opportunity to be a part of his story because there's somebody else writing a story right now too. There, there's another voice perhaps saying, I, I can't do that in front of all these people. I've got too much pride. That means I, I'm wrong. That means I haven't been doing what I'm supposed to do and I certainly don't want anybody, I don't want to be embarrassed. If you're motivated in some way, if Scripture's convicted you in some way to be more faithful, to do the job God's given you better, I hope you'll respond this morning. Be a part of God's story. Don't be a part of the other one. <laughs> Faithfulness, it means something different to everyone, but it means that I, I, I'm loyal that I'm dependable, that God can count on me. And if you've never been baptized into Christ, you've never confessed his name today and every day that he's Lord of my life, that I'm living in his presence, and as I live and I do that, then I'm living by faith. And we would love to help you. We'd love to pray for you. We'd love to encourage you in some way to be a part of his story and respond to be a faithful servant of God as together we stand and as we sing.